Lord, we thank thee for the gift of life, for the capacity to inquire and seek out and wonder and marvel and worship, that thou hast set us in a universe that invites and entices and sometimes goads and demands, that thou hast placed in us questions that exceed our answers and hungers that exceed our sustenance, we thank thee for the power of thought and the capacity to share with one another, the capacity to love and to believe and to hope. Speak to us through the experience and knowledge of those who are our teachers. Speak to us in the demands and the promises of our own lives. And speak to us in the love and faith of those who have known thy will and served thee well especially him who is called thy son, our Lord. Amen. We welcome you to this opening lecture of the fourth Nobel Conference. In this fine assembly are representatives, faculty, and students from 43 colleges and 84 schools in addition to other friends and representatives of the public. Most especially, we welcome the distinguished scholars who have come to share with us their experience and insights and reflections on the uniqueness of man. The Nobel conferences held each January continue an association between Gustavus Adolphus College and the program of the Nobel Foundation which came into being in May of 1963 when the Nobel Hall of Science was dedicated. The inside of the back page of your program describes that event and pictures the 26 Nobel laureates who were in attendance at that time. While this association is informal and unofficial, we are grateful to have the continuing council of representatives of the foundation in planning these conferences, as well as the con council of an advisory committee of Nobel laureates. There is a certain logic that has led us from one subject to another as these conferences have developed. From genetics and the future of man and its concern with what may be called the problem of heredity, we move to the control of environment. And aspects of both of these led us to focus on the human mind at our conference last year. As we prepared for this conference, we were drawn toward two interrelated patterns of ideas, which seemed in a sense to be left over from our consideration of a year ago, and also to point the way ahead. One of these was the evolutionary setting itself, and the other was the uniquely human as it emerges in that evolutionary setting. This is the framework in which our subject matter will be approached during these next two days. We have, however, made clear to our lectures that we were not subdividing a subject and assigning them what they were to concern themselves about, but rather that we wanted them to talk about what they considered to be most relevant to the general theme. Our opening lecture is a minor exception in that we did ask him to speak on a subject which we suggested. We asked Father McMullen, in effect, to sharpen our tools for the assignment which we are about to undertake. As a scholar of high standing in the disciplines of science, philosophy, and theology, we asked him to take a broad look at man's effort to understand the universe as a part of and preparatory to our attempt to understand ourselves. His credentials are listed in your programs, and I shall not repeat them. Before presenting him, I want to advise you that there will be opportunity for questions at the end of his lecture. 
Write your questions on the form which you have received. They will be picked up at the close. There will then be a very brief pause for those who need to leave at that time or who wish to do so. Third hour classes will convene at the close of the convocation, when the convocation is over. I'm now happy to present to you Father Ernan McMullen, Professor of Philosophy and Head of the Department of Philosophy at the University of Notre Dame, Notre Dame, Indiana, who will speak to us on man's effort to understand the universe. Father McMullen. When I arrived at Minneapolis-St. Paul Airport last night, in company with my distinguished colleagues for this occasion, we were met by some reporters, and reporters always have the right question. My question happened to be, well, what good is philosophy anyway? And as I stand here before you on this occasion, in the part of prologue to what is to come, I keep asking myself that question. I hope I'll be able to answer it, not directly, but in a very indirect fashion as I go. My part is prologue here. That is, I am trying to set the stage for some of the most distinguished men in the world in this area of the descent and nature of man. Before they speak to us later in this conference, I want to take, as President Carlson said, a broader view for the moment of an effort which has been sharpened so much in our own century, the effort to understand the universe, but an effort which in some sense is as old as man himself, however that be, old that be, and an effort in some sense which I think defines man. Everyone has his own candidate for an adjective to put in front of animal when we define man, whether it be the symbol-making animal or the rational animal. But there is certainly one thing about man, and that is that he is an ambitious animal. And he has always been so, right from the beginning. If we trace man back half a million years and try to, very fumblingly, discover what it is that has marked him off so sharply, and increasingly sharply as time went on from those among whom he lived, I think one could readily enough take this defining characteristic to be an effort to understand the universe, whatever one means by that word, understand. The understanding of understanding, as we'll see, is perhaps the most difficult task we have to face. Let me, for a moment, before I begin the topic proper, let me look back 300 years to the 17th century. In the 17th century, men were beginning to realize for the first time, or almost for the first time, that man as a geographical entity, as a, as a, a being limited in time and space, was far more insignificant than had ever been thought until that time. The immense stretches of space that had been opened up by the newly discovered telescope, the immense reaches of time that theory was beginning to open up also, although that would not be fully seen for another century or so, these enormous trackless reaches of time and of space which are reflected so poignantly in 17th century poetry. One always looks to the poets to catch the spirit of a time. In these enormous reaches, man seemed to be lost. When Milton writes in Paradise Lost of Man, one notes all the time the metaphor of space, of enormous, boundless space, in which the earth is but a small corner, a small sprinkle of dust, and man is a tiny atom on that dust mote. Insignificant then, physically speaking, in a universe that seems to be losing its meaning, meaning in any human sense at least, man is beginning to seem like a very insignificant corner 
of a vast and hostile env environment. This feeling, which is a peculiarly 17th century one, I think, in which in the succeeding centuries caused, has given rise to many reactions of various kinds, this feeling, which permeates so much of the poetry and thought of the 17th century, is the sort of feeling that the scientist today so often is tempted by or encounters. And what I, the, the first response, the, what I want to draw attention to in the 17th century, the first response to this feeling was very frequently the response of turning to man's mind it was the century of mind, in a way. It was the century of Descartes, the century in which man was the mental animal, the being with mind, the being that was marked off by a power, a power of mind, a spiritual power, that completely separated him from matter, from the natural creation even. And so in this century, the answer that was so very often given to the question that we are posed here of the uniqueness of man, the answer so often given was simply mind. Man may be a very small corner of a vast universe, but man can comprehend that vast universe. His mind can stretch outwards. His mind has an enormous outreach that somehow or other brings that entire stretch of space and time potentially within his grasp. He is the center of the universe then, not in any geographical or simple sense. He is the center because everything comes to a focus in him. Everything comes to a focus because he can bring it to a focus. That answer is a partial answer. I'm not going to have time today to discuss the limitations of it as an answer. But I want to try to develop it as at least a partial answer to the question of the uniqueness of man. Man has made efforts at understanding the universe right from the beginning. And I want to pause on three efforts that he has made, if one could put it in that way, three moments in the continuing human effort to understand the cosmos in which he is placed. I call these the moments of language of myth and of science. And I want to dwell particularly on the third of these because it is within the third moment that we are situated mostly, and it is within the third moment that much of the later discussion will be cast. But in discussing the third moment, in discussing scientific understanding of the universe, it is well to remember that there are other aspects of understanding that have preceded it and that continue today. The moment of language is the basic one, in a way, much more basic than that of science. Language marks off men in some way. There is much debate as to just what way it marks off men, since, as we know very well today, animals have languages of sorts. They use signs in various ways, symbol, uh, signals at least in various ways. And so it becomes technically a quite delicate and difficult problem to define the notion of language in the context of men. Some of my colleagues at this conference have done distinguished work indeed on this very problem, and I can leave it to them. But let me say in summary outline that it seems relatively well agreed that men has been marked off as long as we can stretch back by an ability to texture the universe in symbols that are connected in a very complex way. His language is propositional. It can make statements. It can stretch out. It contains symbols, terms, words that are conventional, that man can modify at will. They are not part of his instinct or his heredity. The child has to laboriously learn them. Man does not get an endowment of signs. Man does not inherit a language. Man has to learn his language, which is a hard effort, as every child or every adult who tries to learn a foreign language knows. But in compensation for that effort, 
there is the counterability to change the effort or to change the language. There is a creative element built in here, an ability to modify language as time goes on, to meet new kinds of situation, to stretch in different ways. Man has the ability then not only to speak, but to change his speech, to texture it according to the needs of the day. And so he has a language which consists of signs, names, verbs, adjectives, connected in a very complex array that we're only beginning to understand, the structures of which in some ways still elude us. This is man's first response as man, I think, a language, a language which he himself constructs, a language which is not, not primarily at least, certainly, genetically oriented. It is something which he hands on culturally, from mother to child, from father to son, from one generation of the tribe to the next, and it changes as it goes. This language has one particular characteristic that in which we are very interested here, namely that it allows him to, to open a window, if you like, on the world. Now, what I mean by that worn metaphor is simply this, that within language, there are certain signs, certain words, let's call it by the familiar name here, which open out the entire universe. That is what language is, because it does not consist of proper names of individual objects. It consists, for the most part, of signs which have an infinite reach. We use a word like men. It applies to all men. We use a word like water stretches outward, too, to all water. We may not know a very sharp definition of man or of water or of sky or of red or all the other words which go to make up our language, but if we can use them correctly in the context of other words, in other words, if we know a language, then there is a network within which water and sky and fire and earth and man himself has already been captured. What I'm trying to say is something very simple and very obvious, namely that the ability to use a language of the human sort is already a giant step to the understanding of the universe as a whole. An inanimate object, such as a stone, is limited to just where he is, if you want to use the personal noun, to where it is, in space or in time, its boundaries are set by where it is. It is no presence elsewhere in space or in time than where it is. A plant has a slightly larger reach. There is an inflow and an outflow, a transformation, a physical transformation of a chemical sort in which it makes use of its environment. But its presence is also very limited in space and in time. In time, it is entirely limited to where it is, although there is an element of growth, of course. In space, it can draw upon what immediately touches it physically, but again, a limited presence. As we move outward to the world of the animal, to the world of movement and of knowledge, we find the reach increasing, because here we find a being that inherits a past to some extent, inherits a past that has been genetically built up over billions of years to fit it for its environment, and in which in particular, by means of its senses, it can stretch outwards in space. By means of its memory, it can stretch backwards in time. In the animal, it's a limited stretch, admittedly. It can see the stars in some sense, although it usually will not dwell on that. It can see its environment, its memory goes back in an individual way. But these are limited powers. In man, that limitation has been already broken to a very large extent by the use of language, by the simple structuring of the world that language can give him. Language is already a cutting up of the world. The verbs cut up our actions the nun cuts up the structures of our world, the adjectives, 
locate the properties. They interrelate them with one another. Even the most primitive of languages is already a gigantic network of understanding, a web that man casts on his world. The web may not be a very good one. The primitive languages may not achieve their purposes very fully. But if, in fact, they are human languages, and if, in fact, man can carry on his purposes by means of them, his purposes of communication, of expression, of declaration, if these purposes can be fulfilled, then already man understands the universe, his corner of it, because he can relate it to the unexpected. The water he meets will be water. The sky he meets will be sky. The elephants he meets will be elephants. In other words, it's not simply a matter here of recognizing a pattern that he has seen before. When he sees an elephant or a beast of prey, he understands this not simply in the sense of recognizing danger for himself, but of situating this animal as one among animals, relating it to other animals, beginning then a set of words that will relate everything together. This is the beginning of science, the beginning of understanding. This moment of man, which is still shrouded, the origins of which is, uh, are still shrouded in so much obscurity, so much debate today, probably will always remain in some obscurity. This moment stretches back perhaps half a million years, as far back as man himself goes. One can assume, I think, that as man became man, language became language. And it went on for a long time, this groping and trying and fitting, this finding of symbolic equivalents that would allow man to open the window, this way of opening a world, this kind of network that man has to put between himself and the world. As a limited creature, man has no direct way of grasping outwards. There is no way in which man can reach out to the star and touch it. But there is a way in which he can describe it in his language and bring it in his grasp by that means. Relate, it, relate star to other star, relate star to nebula, relate star to earth and to man himself. I said there was a second moment, a moment which is in many ways even more complex, and a moment on which I will not dwell today because of limits of time, the moment of myth, again as old as man presumably. When man sees the world in which he is, he tends to see it as the place of man, which it is of course, whatever else it is. And so he sees that world as responding to him in some way and him as responding to the world. He sees in it persons, other people. He tends to see in it, particularly in the past, tended to see in it a person itself. The nature in which he was placed was somehow a thou, a person, in some way to which personal words could be attached. When the Nile for the ancient Egyptian did not rise, it refused to rise. It wasn't just that it didn't rise, it refused to rise. Nature did not respond to man. And so in a way that to our more sophisticated minds today is out of reach, I think, in some respects, the early man here, in his way of speaking about the universe, about the great questions of man and of origins, created myths, myths that ran deep in his consciousness, myths which were set in personal terms, always in personal terms. And these were efforts in some sense to understand, not at all as we speak of understanding. There was no question of test or verification or evidence. This would have been entirely inappropriate as a question. Rather, it was a matter of bringing man into communion with nature, if we can speak of language as a mode of communication, the myth was in some sense a mode of communion. Somehow the myth, as it was, for example, reenacted every year in ritual, accomplished something by reestablishing man's contact with the, 
the drama of nature, the dramatic interrelationships, the dramatic events that go on in nature itself, the seasons, the death of the sun each day, all of the things on which man's life so obviously depends, upon which man himself depends so clearly. The myth then is a way in which man relates himself to nature, to the universe, to the gods. It is a way in which the God can speak to him and tell him what he himself is to be and to do. The myth then is basic here. It still is. When I use the word myth here, I am, of course, not using it in the contemporary negative sense of something fictional. The myth is a personal attempt here on the part of man to enter into a drama of which he knows himself to be a part. Poetry is the best example, probably, of myth today. The poet, the great poet especially, creates a myth in which man plays a part. It focuses on man. It stretches outwards to locate man in a drama in which he himself is the principal actor. It attempts to bring nature and God into focus for man, since these are the two other great parts in the human drama. But the myth itself is cast in terms that man can understand, in terms of, emotiv of motivations and emotions, causes of repetitions, of the kinds of things that man can feel familiar with, and in that way stretch out to values that make him be human. Myth then takes many forms. It takes the form of poetry. It takes the form of the religious understanding. It takes the form of the primitive who hands on from generation to generation myths of origin myths of communion. All of this basic understanding of the nature of man as, it, as he finds himself in the universe of which he himself is the central part. I want to move on, however, from this moment of myth, which is so complex and so richly structured, into the third moment, which itself is so complex too, the moment of science. And by science here, I don't simply mean contemporary science. I mean science in a much broader and older sense, namely of man's effort <coughs> to understand in a way which would respond to question. This is what I will mean here by science. Science is an, uh, the answer that man gives which can answer, so to speak, to a test of some kind. It is a self-aware understanding. It is an understanding which has built into it a method of test, of validation. Now, of course, the methods of validation can be of very many kinds, and the history of them is the history of science itself. But let me stress then from the beginning that by science then, I mean some sort of systematic understanding of the universe or of some part of the universe, which has built into it a method of testing, a method of verification. The notion of truth for the first time makes its appearance. Truth is not a necessary part of language. Much of language has little to do with truth. Truth is not a part of myth in any simple sense of that. Myth is a much more complex thing than a simple statement, although it is not unrelated to truth. But science is directly defining of truth in a way. Truth is, in fact, what science seeks in a very definite sense of that word. Here we find a complex story. And let me begin at the beginnings, and let me try to be as explicit here as I can. We speak of scientific method today, rather glibly, the introduction to our textbooks speak of scientific method as though it was something like operating a washing machine, take a certain number of things, mix them together, bring them to the right temperature, and the wash will come out right. 
Now, anyone who has done any science knows, of course, that this is a travesty of what, in fact, goes on. Scientific method, even today, after our centuries of groping for a method, is not a single thing. Indeed, one of the most distinguishing characteristics of science has always been controversy. If methods were as sharp as they are sometimes supposed to be, there wouldn't be controversy, I take it, in science. But if one, as a, just as a rule of thumb, if one wants to find what the interesting parts of science are at any given time, one looks for where the controversy is occurring, where science, scientists are calling one another idiots. Those are the interesting parts of science. And the presence of those, for example, the very widespread presence of such areas in contemporary science indicate the points of interest in contemporary science. Now, if we go back to the beginnings of that kind of science, the beginnings as far as we can stretch back to them, we find a very interesting situation. I'm going back now a little over 2,000 years to Greece and looking at a Greece which in some ways did not seem all that different from other nations, from other, not from other states of the ancient world surrounding it, around Greece, four centuries BC. There were other countries like Babylonia with a powerful astronomy, China further off with a powerful technology even then. There were other nations at that time that had made strides in the domination of the material universe, in the accumulation of facts, in the attempt in some sense to relate these facts with one another. In other words, there were many other nations, many other civilizations of that time, powerful river, river civilizations like Egypt or Babylonia, which had for centuries carried on the efforts of a kind of primitive science. But somehow or other in Greece, some magic work, some magic, the inspiration of which we'll never know, I suppose. Some magic work to make man look at things in a little different way. An ambition was kindled then that has never since been quieted. An ambition that carries men to the moon and beyond today, that carries men of science in their imaginations as far as the furthest nebula. And this was an attempt to construct a speculative understanding of the universe that would somehow rest upon man's experience, an answer to man's experience, to observation in some sense at least, and be open to some kind of rational exploration. The early Greeks of Ionia were physicists, as we call them still today. They constructed a notion of nature itself which is what physics means, a notion of nature as something regular, something that can be understood. For them, of course, astronomy was the simplest example of what man can achieve. Because as man looks to the stars, he can see regular patterns there. He can see things that return, that can be predicted, that can not, of course, be controlled, but that can, in some sense, be brought under the compass of human symbols, the symbols, in this case, of mathematics. And so a humanly constructed language, the language of mathematics, can somehow bring within the ambit of man the movements of the planets and the stars themselves. The stars had a simple movement. There was nothing particularly complicated about their daily circle. But an extraordinary understanding came with the planets. Because the planets had a complex motion, an irregular motion, as their own name originally indicated. And this irregular motion, at first sight, seems simply a random thing, and yet somehow or other, by a very complex combination of circles or of, as we might say today, equations of mathematical symbols, man can see where the stars will be. He can think of them as following paths that he himself can grasp. And so one element then in this early ambition was astronomy the understanding of regularities that are in fact there. Had man had no sky, had he been a Venusian, for example, born on the planet Venus, where presumably he couldn't see the sky, one gathers for other reasons that life on the 
surface of Venus would be rather uncomfortable, but where there to be life there of a rational sort, one wonders how long science would take to develop without a sky. At any rate, man did have a sky, and man did develop an astronomy. But there was much more to it than that. The Babylonians had an, a very much more extensive astronomy in some ways than the Greeks did. Another thing broke through at this time that was to have an enormous influence, I think, on human ambitions. And that was something today very commonplace in a way, namely geometry. Geometry, which was the first mathematical science in the strict sense, geometry was a way of structuring an entire area of human understanding. Geometry itself, in one sense, was much older, as the name indicates. It was a way of measuring land. But during this early Greek period, it was realized that all of these truths of geometry could be interconnected. In particular, it was realized that the interrelationship between these truths was of a deductive kind, as we call it today. That is to say that there, cert there were certain among these truths that were basic, first principles as they were called, and from which all other truths in this domain could be derived. Now, this is a powerful instance, a powerful example of structure. It means that when man tries to understand spatial relationships, something terribly important in the practical sense at all times for man, when he tries to understand this domain of spatial relationships, he can do so by simply stretching out for a small handful of truths, the famous five axioms of Euclid, Truths that themselves are apparently self-evident, or simple at least. They seem to be quite acceptable intuitively. And then of building outwards by means of a precisely defined rule, which is what deduction means, to all the truths there are in this domain. Now notice what this ambition is. The ambition here, then, is to discover a small number of truths, truths which have the word truth marked on them in some sense, on their own foreheads, is imprinted the notion of truth. They are self-verifying. We don't have to test them by means of observation, for example. It would have been absurd to the Greeks, as indeed it would be to us, to test an axiom of geometry by going out and with rulers, measuring and so on, the angles of triangles. This is not, in fact, what they're about. <laughs> they are seen to be true, to be self-evident, to be necessarily so. And from these few, this small handful of truths, all of this gigantic domain of geometry, these hundreds of theorems can be developed, so many of them very complex. Now, <clears throat> when this realization broke through the Greek mind, it placed there, it seems to me, an ideal of science, which in some sense has carried us to the present day. In some sense, it has proved illusory, as I hope to show in a moment. But on the other hand, it did give a high ideal, a dream, a dream that man has since tried to live up to, of a geometrical kind of structure, not geometrical in the quantitative sense, but geometrical in the sense of a small number of truths or principles which man could directly grasp, which he would see by the power of his mind alone without any need, then, for any kind of observation or any kind of test, or in particular, for any kind of hesitation. Geometry is not something that has to be modified as the centuries pass. It can be added to, of course. But geometry is, above all, eternal truth. And so the first model of science, the first model of human understanding in this powerful validating sense, is of an eternal set of truths, truths that seem somehow divine, truths in whose attainment perception and language play a role, of course, but a minor role. They are discarded somehow once, once the truth has been attained. The slave boy in the Mino, the great dialogue, one of the great short dialogues of Plato, the slave boy draws a diagram in the sand, and Socrates very rapidly brings him to an understanding of what at that time was one of the great triumphs of the Greek reason, the theorem of Pythagoras, and a few well-chosen questions, Socrates leads him to the uh, 
grasp of that theorem. And when that theorem is grasped, the diagram in the sand is erased. It's no longer needed. Perception is not that upon which the science rests in any sense. It is simply an occasion to bring the mind to a direct grasp of the truth. This then <coughs> was the model that inspired Greek science, that gave rise to the great hopes of Greek science, the enormous efforts of the legions of scientists of those days. And I don't mean simply the mathematicians and the, the astronomers, I mean, for example, the biologists, the enormous labors of an Aristotle who cataloged more than 500 species alone himself. The enormous efforts then to bring into an intelligible array the world of living things, of non-living things, in the hope that somehow or other beyond that effort would lie a science of the universe in which there would be a small number of principles and from which all else could be derived according to a specifiable rule. Were science to be of that kind, of course, the place within it of creativity would be limited because deduction is not creative. Deduction is simply the carrying on of a specified rule. It is tedious. It is best done by machine. The only creative moment in a deductive science is the finding of the principles, and of course that's not quite so simple. Once one has it, however, everything, as Bacon would say in a later phrase, will go as if by clockwork. The first ideal, then, as I say, of what it is to understand the universe in this powerful, stable, and eternal sense is of a penetration of the universe by means of the human mind, which will be, in fact, self-verifying. It will not require any further test, and it will not be modified. The supposition on which this ideal was based required two things and 2,000 years of experience has shown that neither of these is in fact verified. First of all, it requires a universe whose interconnections are transparent to us. In other words, it argues for a kind of transparency, a lucidity in the natural universe that will open to us as mathematical relations would. This is, in fact, not the case. The rich and complex universe of the biologist, with its complexities of history, its complexities of function, do not, in fact, lend themselves to the transparent gaze of the scientist, as Aristotle once hoped. They are messy, very messy indeed. There is the universe, the internal structure, does not have, in fact, the transparency to us that the Greeks once hoped. And on the other side, the human mind is not the powerful instrument that the Greeks also thought it to be. The inspiration, the ambition of geometry will, will indeed carry one into one domain of structure, the structures, the pure structures of the mathematician, which are generated by man himself, but once one goes to the stubborn realm of fact, the stubborn realm which is over against man, the realm which acts against him, a realm in which experiments will not come out, in which the unexpected happens, in which the unexpected is in fact the key to understanding, in that world the penetration of the geometer will not suffice, and the human mind itself does not have that kind of grasp that ideal of science, which has often been called the conceptualist ideal, sometimes the rationalist ideal, was important because it set man on the right road. It was an overly ambitious road, a road that would, in a sense, not arrive at its dest could never arrive at its destination, but it would set man on the right road. If one moves ahead a long way in time <clears throat> to the 17th century, the second stopping point. I'm obviously leaving out a great many important things along the way. But if one moves to the 
second great period of development in natural science in the 17th century, one finds still, curiously, a great deal of hesitation upon this very point as to what science itself is. Even though we today very often describe the 17th century as a period of empiricism, a period in which observation and rolling balls and inclined planes and all such like played a great part, indeed, in a way, this was not so, or at least not clearly so. Most of the great figures of the 17th century, Galileo, for example, Descartes, Newton, just to take those three, still hoped for a science not altogether unlike the science of the Greeks. It would be very unlike it <coughs> in one respect, at least very unlike that of Aristotle, because its language would be that of mathematics. But it would be very like it in this respect that its principles would be directly grasped. They would be immutable. They would be final. They would somehow or other impress themselves upon us by their lucidity. The laws of Newton, for example, the so-called laws, the theory of Newton as it's more correctly called today, seemed to Newton and certainly to Newton's followers as something once grasped were seen to be simply so. It was true that they had a relationship, a complex relationship with observation, but it was quite evident to the men of Newton's time that the laws of Newton could not be verified, certainly not in any simple sense of verification. One cannot go out and ask in any simple sense whether or not force is equal to the product of mass and acceleration, or whether it's equal to the rate of change of momentum, as Newton originally put it. One can't ask this question in some simple kind of observational sense and perform a set of observations that will test it. To put it very simply, the three basic laws, so-called laws of Newton, were not directly amenable to experimental tests. And this was something that Newton himself and his followers very clearly realized. And so this growing science of the 17th century, which was centered about a mechanics, the simplest part of science because it deals with the most basic part of uh, the world in which we live, namely its motion. This first science, this first example of a natural science, which influenced and continues to influence our ideal of what science should be, this first science was not, in fact, in any simple sense, seen to be an experimental or observational science, even though it was related, of course, and in a very complex way with experiment and observation. What I'm trying to say was this, you see, that in this century, <clears throat> there was still a great deal of hesitation about the role of human insight, and especially the role of human insight in the validation, in the verification of what was being said. When someone put forward a theory, the word theory was coming to be used, when someone put forward a worldview, a mechanical worldview as Newton did, on what did it rest? Did it rest upon the fact that it could make cor correct predictions? Did it rest upon the fact that it brought so much under human understanding? Did it rest upon the fact that it somehow was seen to be necessarily so, once grasped? What did it rest on? There was a great deal of hesitation in the answer to this question. The philosophers of that time had much to say about that, and so had the scientists. But there was no simple answer. There was no agreement as to what the answer should be. And the great scientists themselves, as I've said, for the most part, tended still to a rationalist or a conceptualist hope that somehow or other their basic principles in mechanics would rest on some kind of lucidity, a lucidity in the world, in this semi-created world of theirs of frictionless objects moving in vacuo and so on. In this obviously highly created, highly abstracted world, the entities followed the laws that were prescribed for them. And these laws, which somehow were rooted in the natural universe, but somehow also removed from it, since the natural universe is a messy place of friction and other such uh, difficult things to handle, in this natural world, there was an approximation to the perfect laws of the physicist, of the chemist, 
But these laws themselves seem to somehow carry beyond anything that one could find in observation. Now what I'm saying then is this, that this second scientific moment in the understanding of the universe still had a great deal of obscurity surrounding it from the point of view of exactly what it rested upon. It was using, for the first time, controlled experiment very widely. It was, however, abstracting from this, moving backwards to all kinds of idealizations, moving backwards from a world of color and of light and of music to a world of quantity and of wavelength, ultimately, where it seemed that light and color and sound and somehow or other meaning had no part. In the 18th and 19th centuries, many people, the poets especially, many of the philosophers, reacted against this world, the so-called romantic movement, which was a movement of revolt in some ways against the increasingly dehuman or inhuman world of the scientist, began to pick up momentum. But as we come to our own day, as we try to understand science today, we have to take into account, it seems to me, two kinds of component or two kinds of aspect in it. First of all, there is a sense in which the Greeks were right. There is a sense in which the human mind does have within it a power of structuring, a power of perception, a power of organizing a field, and in particular, a power of breaking the mold, if I might put it that way. Man is not bound by rule, by method. Other animals are, machines in particular are, but there is somehow within man a kind of a flaw, if you want to put it that way, a flaw in one sense, because man can break, break the rule, which is what creativity is. Human creativity is limited by its materials. There are certain materials given. But the way in which it is specifically creative is to go beyond anything that has been given before, in particular, any rule that has been given before. And so the major moments of creativity in science, as in any domain of human effort, in art, for example, are moments in which the mold has been broken, in which the rules have been set aside, not wholly set aside, only God can do that, can disregard his materials and his traditions entirely, so to speak. The human, the, the finite, is always limited by a tradition, because if he ignores it, he will not be understood or appreciated, or he himself will not understand or appreciate. At any rate, man does have a material, a tradition, a time, a place, but within this he can transcend it somehow by moving beyond to a new understanding, a new insight, a new rule. And so then, in this sense, as some modern recent writers have been stressing, people like Polanyi, for example, that there is a power within men, a power of knowing, a power of structuring, which cannot be <coughs> left aside. And this power, which is almost like an aesthetic power of appreciation, is part of what science is. It's important to remember that. In that sense, I think the Greeks were right. There is a, a power of penetration in the human mind, which some have to a greater extent than others, and a power which is not, in fact, statable in terms of explicit linguistic rules. And it is because of this power of transcendence that science has a history and is not static. On the other hand, and here I come perhaps to a more important point to stress, and especially because of the way in which I have tried to shape this dialogue, there is a control on this power. Man's mind is not so powerful, nor the universe so transparent, that he can readily stretch forth. His power of insight is limited and frequently fallible, always fallible and frequently wrong. That is to say, there has to be some kind of control on man. And this is where, in fact, the patient hours of experiment and observation, the patient attempts to build up generalization, the groping for new symbols, the humble attempt to be limited by what is, by what truly is. 
That is equally important. What I'm saying is this then, that the method of contemporary science, there isn't any single method, but the nerve of contemporary science is partially lies in the ability to somehow distill observation, distill it in a complex way through symbols created by us, but which are somehow always returning to the level of the control of the observation. I'm putting this in a very general way here by saying that man is always forced to acknowledge that he is a creature here, that he is limited, that his power of observation is not very far and is very slow, will take, has taken so long to get to where it is and has a long road ahead of it. This power is a limited one then, and so observation, patient observation, is necessary. Recently I visited Mount Palomar and a very distinguished scientist, one of the co-discoverers of the quasars, happened to be working there the night before and he showed me the product of his night's work, about seven hours of work. The product of that seven hours of work was a tiny rectangle of film, about an inch long by a quarter of an inch wide. This was entire night's work. I looked at it, it didn't look terribly impressive. And he looked at it with considerably more enthusiasm than I had been showing. And he said, don't you see the spectrum there? He put it under a microscope. I could see some lines of sorts, I suppose, but I wasn't terribly, uh, if someone had told me there wasn't a spectrum there, I'd probably have accepted that too. At any rate, he said, yes, that's a spectrum. So I said, what's it a spectrum of? And then he showed me a map of the sky. And he said, do you see that star there on this enormous map, wall map of the sky? And I said, yes, it was a very dim star. He said, that's a star which is not visible to the naked eye. And then he said, it really isn't a star. It's a globular cluster. Now let me show you a picture of that globular cluster. And he showed me another equally large picture. And he said, do you see that star inside that globular cluster? Well, that little thing you have in your hand is the spectrum of the elements in that star. In other words, a star in an invisible or nearly invisible cluster had somehow been captured in that man's hand. Some feature of it had been captured. But the point I want to make here was this. Here was a man who had spent many hours not just the hours of a night, but the hours of a lifetime, in the incredibly complex effort to grasp that small fact, a few beams of light from an almost incredibly distant star at the other end of the universe from us, had somehow been grasped in a way by him. He could tell me, for example, the proportion of the different chemical elements in this star. Now, here we have an example of the humility of science, the humility of the scientific understanding, the humility it hasn't always shown and still does not always show, the humility which acknowledges that the universe is in fact not transparent to us and that an enormous labor, patient labor, is required in order to bring it into our grasp. And that even when it does bring it into our grasp, a constant control and continuing control is required. In other words, when we speak of a scientific understanding of the universe today, we do not speak of it any longer in terms of geometrical truths, of truths grasped in themselves or of truths once grasped that are forever so. Scientific knowledge as we see it today is constantly being adjusted, constantly being improved, constantly being deepened. There are no finalities in it, no finalities in any simple sense of that term at least. A theory is constantly capable of sharpening and the reason for that is a very simple one. The theory is a symbol. It is something that we interpose between ourselves and the real, a window as I've called it on the real. And windows are always windows. They can always be improved. Their transparency can constantly be worked upon. And so we have to work upon our science and keep improving it. There are no peaks within it that are beyond scaling, perhaps. But there are always peaks that are outside our reach. We are constantly forced to climb. And climbing is a hard effort. It is not simply a matter of sitting 
and penetrating geometrical truths. Not that that is an easy effort either, but there is the messy effort of the lab, the Murphy's Law, which says that if anything can go wrong, it will. Now, I'm sure you're all familiar with that law if you've ever worked in a scientific lab. Now, in this effort, this constant effort to understand, I have tried then to balance two components. I'm obviously greatly simplifying the situation here. The component on the one hand, which is peculiarly human, the component of penetration, of insight, as we call it, of understanding, which allows man to structure the data he has, to see beyond it in a new way, to see a new kind of significance in the structure he has. Now this is something radically, not only radically human, but also in a sense, um, it is a, let me put it this way, it is a skill which is almost an individual skill, not shared by all. The dentist who looks at an x-ray of your teeth and says, it always seems a little gleefully, I see a cavity there, <clears throat> is seeing something that you can't see, at least I can't ever see. I always hope it's there when he tells me about it. I certainly pay for it. But um, when he sees this, he is exercising a skill of perception which has been carefully trained over years and which has been trained in this sense that if he keeps seeing cavities and opens the teeth and there aren't any cavities, I hope at least he'll be out of business. There is a control then on the skill, an implicit control. The young man who begins as a bacteriologist will not see anything very much in the slides. It will be a, a mass of, uh, well, whatever, um, not easily un understood. As the time goes by, he will structure that field more and more as time goes on. He will see structure there. And it is not as though his teacher can point to him in some simple way and say, well, of course, those are uh, staphylococcus or something like that. There is a lot more to it than a set of rules, as anyone who has worked in any scientific domain knows. There is a long period of sharpening a skill. And I'm taking as examples for the moment, the examples that, for exa that Polanyi and others have stressed, the examples of perception in science, the microscope slide, for example. But <clears throat> it would be, of course, wrong to suppose that science is basically a matter of structuring perception. This analogy is a very limited one. This is the danger of it, in fact, because it is the, real, the really advanced, the really difficult, the really important moments in science come when an entire field of conceptions are structured. When an Einstein, for example, a young man sits down and looks at the entire domain of mechanics, of space and of time, of the concepts of mass and of acceleration and of space and of time, complex notions then that have been honed by 300 years, by 2,000 years of effort. When he looks at those concepts, and when I say look here, I don't mean that he has them stretched out in front like a microscope slide. When he sees them somehow in his mind, when he, with this unique human power of insight, structures them, and when the answer comes out different, when space and time and mass and acceleration, velocity, momentum, these complex and abstract and in some sense remote terms, come to have a different relationship with one another. What happens there, what happens in this conceptual revolution that, for example, was Einstein's, the theory, first theory of relativity. When that happens, something has happened, I am claiming here, that is peculiarly human. There is an ability of restructuring a world there that man seems to have, mediated by the symbols that he can construct. But over against this power, and I keep recalling this point because it can be somehow overlooked. Over against this power is the stubborn power of the universe to resist it. A universe that therefore is not transparent, that is not simple. A universe that may perhaps in some respects always lie beyond the human grasp. Let me end my story here on that point, on the question of the limits of human understanding of the universe. Science is a relatively recent effort in the last sense in which I have defined it. Its history is a matter of a few hundred or at most a few thousand years. And as one looks into the future, one is puzzled to know what to make of it. What will science be like in a hundred or especially in a thousand years' time, presuming that the world is still here for science? 
to work upon. Leaving aside then the obviously unanswerable questions that lie only within the human heart, questions of peace and of war, of motive and of hope and love, leaving aside these questions, which of course are the real questions when all is said and done, but leaving them aside, let us ask for a moment the difficult question of where science may go. I'm asking this in a purely speculative way. It's a question that often is not asked. And let me suggest that the answer to this is not so simple. It seems to me, it seems to me at least, it is a very difficult thing. One cannot predict, one never could have predicted in the past the future of science. A hundred years ago, one could certainly not have looked forward to many of the things that have happened since. But there are certain kinds of problems that do, in fact, press themselves upon us. And let me for a moment look upon an analogy here with the domain I've mentioned frequently, the domain of mathematics. The mathematician is a man who constructs his world of symbols, and he seems free. There is no limit, it might seem, upon his power. The only criterion, the only criterion that the mathematician would seem to acknowledge is the criterion of consistency. A severe one, it's true, but one for which a test, or so it seemed, could be applied. And so in the early part of this century, great mathematicians like Hilbert and others formulated a daring and a more or less new ideal of science, drawing upon the results especially of the new geometries and others, to say that science or mathematics was an axiomatic system which was simply a construction of man, lim limited only by the internal criterion of consistency. As many of you know, this great hope for, for mathematics was doomed to founder on a simple theorem, a single theorem, the great theorem of Gödel. Gödel's theorem, now 30 years old, showed that that hope of mathematics was doomed and perpetually doomed to failure, that the mathematician could not, in fact, construct a complex system whose consistency could be demonstrated in this way. I'm not going to go into the complexities of that theorem. Obviously, it would be inappropriate here. I'm simply pointing out here almost a sociological fact that here a powerful domain of human knowledge runs into a barrier that was wholly unexpected and a barrier right at its very heart, so to speak, namely at the entire notion of consistency proofs, which are the, in a certain sense, the heart of contemporary, or at least were the heart of contemporary mathematics. If one takes a, sim a, a, a system even as simple as arithmetic, which is the, one of the oldest forms of mathematics, one runs in then to this barrier, which is not, as it can be shown, a temporary one, but a permanent one. There will always be sentences within the mathematical system whose proof cannot be derived within that system itself. And so the notion of an axiomatic system runs into, it might almost seem, a mysterious barrier here, a curious barrier, and in particular, an unexpected one. Now, <clears throat> I mention that in passing only because mathematics has at all times furnished analogies for physics. And it is very striking here to see this sort of internal barrier develop. Could there be anything like that in the natural sciences? Well, one can't be sure, of course, but there are certain things one can say. Much of science of the last hundred years has consisted of pressing back into the barrier, into the boundaries of the atom, by means of ever and ever larger deployments of energy. One deploys an enormous and an untold amount of energy at a tiny point in order to penetrate the barrier of the atom, to get down to the level of the nucleus and beyond. Now, this is a difficult quest. It lies at the heart of much of contemporary science. But it is an effort, as some distinguished recent scientists have pointed out, an effort that could conceivably reach technological barriers. There is a limit to the amount of energy available. We don't know what it is, but there clearly is a limit, and there is a limit to its deployment. In other words, we may think of the nucleus as having worlds within worlds, as Pascal a long time ago suggested, but even if it has, there is no guarantee that we have the key to unlock those worlds. We will always seek to unlock them, I would assume, but whether or not, or not we will unlock them is another matter. There is a question also here of man's motivation in this domain. 
This is another question, a complicated one. The roads to the frontier of science keep getting longer. Scientific understanding becomes an ever more remote thing. The physics major is tempted more and more to take up literature or social science. You're all familiar with that, and there is an obvious complex of reasons for it. The demands made by the complex natural sciences of today, by mathematics itself, and by, especially by those sciences that adopt its language, the effort required by these is enormous and demanding and continuing. The road to the frontiers grows longer all the time. As one projects that into the future, one comes across one very definite barrier, and that definite barrier, it seems to me, although others might disagree, is the human brain itself, the human mind, which is not, in fact, an infinite one. There are problems, I think, lying there, because the human mind, although it can shortcut and create, is, in fact, when all is said and done, a limited mind, even though it can historically and does historically keep improving. So I'm just pointing here in a number of directions at ways in which the future of man's understanding of the universe can possibly run into difficulties. There are others I could mention too, others, for example, that have already been encountered in quantum theory. But I want to end, however, on a, a somewhat more hopeful note, or at least a more um, positive note, namely this. Even though the physics and chemistry of today are coming closer, it might seem, to a point at which <clears throat> the search for structure, which is what chemistry and physics ultimately is, the search for structure will run into major hurdles, major difficulties that, in fact, at least con conceivably, might not be capable of being overcome. There is another domain, and that is the domain of man himself, where I suspect there is a long further career for human effort. Man is the point at which complexity meets in the universe. If there is one thing about man that we are sure of, it is that he is complex, that the most complex of all laws, the most complex of all properties, meet in him. We know that. Man is the understanding being, and the history that has allowed him to be an understanding being, four billion years of evolutionary history that has come to a point in man at this point in space and time and made him a being capable of understanding the universe, the only being capable of understanding the universe, has brought to a focus in him an almost unimaginable complexity of properties, a complexity of properties that are far beyond our scientific reach even still today. I am saying then that even though the effort of the physicist, which has dominated science for 300 years, the efforts of the chemist, which have gone back even further in some ways, even though these efforts, in some respect, I think, could in the future, and possibly even in the fairly near future, arrive at some serious uh, difficulties, the efforts to understand man himself, first of all, life, biology, but in particular, man himself, that that effort has a long history ahead. Now, I'm not simply making a plug here for everyone to switch from physics into psychology. It's not as simple as that, for reasons that I suspect will come up later in these sessions, because the interrelationship between physics and psychology are indeed very complex. But what I am saying is this, that the properties that make man be the understanding animal he is are the very properties that are the major future challenge for human understanding. Let me then just end with these words, that in man's effort to understand the universe, enormous successes, fantastic successes, overwhelming successes, have been achieved. Successes that make us, in some not stupid sense, proud to be human. But as we look ahead, and it is the looking ahead that makes us human too, as we look ahead, it is that very ability to understand the universe that most is in need of understanding today. As we look ahead then for the future of science, let us look ahead to a period in which human understanding will itself be better understood. Thank you.
Thank you, Father McMullen. I'm sure that all of us have been impressed by the scope of your observations and insight, the clarity and lucidity of your presentation, and the incisiveness with which you focused on problem areas and possible future problems and projects. We will now take a very brief break of two or three minutes. While those of you who have questions, will you pass them to the aisles? Ushers will pass through the aisles to receive the questions, and we will then proceed to a brief period of answering these questions. Let me take the statement which I didn't make, that the human brain is historically improving. And let me just uh, say that it seems, well, first of all, there's a difficulty about what you mean by improving. Um, it might seem that we've been going downhill steadily for at least half a million years um, from several points of view. Obviously, animals are, in, in some sense, much happier than we are. They don't have the same anguish. Uh, there are no existentialists among the animals, for example. Um, so that, in a certain sense, improvement is a little difficult to handle here. Um, things have been getting worse uh, for man steadily for at least half a million years, I should think, from some reasonably well-defined points of view. Nevertheless, we, c we do conventionally say that the human brain has improved in the sense that um, there are certain kinds of powers, certain abilities that the human brain has, which other brains do not have. That is, I have tried to make in an extremely general way, which I have not been able to bring any collateral scientific evidence for, that the human brain, the human, uh, I shouldn't really say the human brain, the human being, is capable of certain kinds of activity, for example, of the construction of symbolic languages involving conventional symbols that are not species dependent, for example. The, the construction of languages of this kind, the construction of uh, uh, these very complex experience-controlled symbols, which we call scientific theories, that this is a, a, a peculiarly human ability. We are quite sure of that. No one has ever questioned that. And this, of course, this ability does, in some very complicated sense, depend on the human brain. Uh, it depends on other things, too, but the human brain, among, among, among others, I'm not saying, there, uh, and one would be wrong to say that the human brain produces them. Uh, this would be to take a very naive view of uh, neurophysiology, it seems to be, or at least of the nature of man. But the human brain is an indispensable part of the human power. It's the locus, in some rather mysterious sense, of the human power to respond to the symbolic question. Now, as to whether or not, I suspect the nerve of this question, however, lay in this, as to whether or not the human brain has improved in the sense of, in some intrinsic way, become more capable of uh, activities, for example, of uh, symbol symbolic construction than it was, say, a thousand years ago or 10,000 years ago. As to whether this is the case or not, I certainly would not want to commit myself as to whether the human brain, for example, and I'm t taking brain on the literal sense of a, a, neural, uh, a neural network of some kind, of a biochemical entity of some sort, uh, as to whether that has changed in some basic respect that provides it with a power it did not otherwise have, as to whether this is the case in historic time, in recent historic time or not, I certainly would not want to say. I should, um, uh, I should think that uh, there would be some difficulty about that. What I would, would really want to say is something a little different. And it may be true that something more than this uh, could be claimed, but what I was really trying to say was something much simpler, namely this, that given the human abilities, given the human abilities in the sense of symbolic construction and so on, 
the liberation of these abilities which lie in man, these uh, abilities which lie, first of all, in man's biochemistry, in man's understanding of himself, in man's ability to use languages, and in the languages available to him. Given these abilities, the putting of them to work of these things, which are, after all, abilities, potencies, powers, but not necessarily powers that can be liberated immediately. The putting of them to work is a long, patient, historic process. To put it in a very, very concrete way, it seems to me that the difference, and I notice the questioner here mentions Aristotle and da Vinci, the difference between Aristotle and da Vinci, or between Aristotle and Einstein, or go further back even than Aristotle and Einstein, is not that Einstein had a better brain than Aristotle. He may have had, or he may not have had. It's quite conceivable he didn't. I'm not even quite sure what better there means in this context. But, but leaving that point altogether aside, you see, this isn't the point. The point about it rather is that Einstein had 2,000 years after Aristotle of cultural and intellectual history to build on. He had Aristotle himself, which was a big help, as a matter of fact, which Aristotle didn't have. Now, uh, you see, this is the difference. It's a cumulative difference. It's a cultural cumulative difference. At least, it's, it may be more than that, but at least it's that. And this is the sort of point I was trying to make. One doesn't realize one po one's potencies right away, otherwise these colleges wouldn't be necessary. Okay. Now, there are a number of questions here that um, have to do with the relationship between the religious understanding of the universe and what I've been talking about. Let me uh, just look through them quickly. One question s puts it quite baldly and says, what role does religion play in man's effort to understand the universe? Um, let me look at the others. Uh, well, perhaps let me answer that, or try to answer that one first. Um, I suspect that may be all I'd be able to answer, or maybe not even this one. What role does religion play? Now, this is a, a peculiarly difficult question, and I'm sure you're all aware of the fact that I, I did not speak very explicitly to it, which may seem odd, especially in these surroundings here, uh, that I didn't uh, make this central. It was somewhat deliberate on my part. We can come back to this, uh, but, um, and we, I'm sure, may come back to it in the panel discussion tomorrow. But as I understood my role here, my role was to set the stage for four men who will in fact speak within the scientific mode of understanding of the incredible achievements in that understanding in the domain of man in the last 50 years. This is what I was mainly trying to focus on. But in doing that, I would by no means want to suggest that the role of religion in man's effort to understand the universe ought to be left aside. I alluded to it under the notion of myth, not in any way to dismiss it. Now, let me just address it for a moment more explicitly. Religious faith, religious understanding, is something rather different to the scientific one in many respects. It concerns nature, it always has, it concerns three uh, domains, if you like. It, concern, uh, it uh, concerns man and God and nature, the three great domains of reality. And in a certain sense, therefore, religion, religious faith, is a consciousness on the part of man, an affirmation on the part of man, of a certain sort of relationship between man and God particularly, but man and God as in some sense also bound together by nature in a complex way, and this will vary with different religions. That is to say, it is not man and God isolated from nature, but man as part of nature, usually, and nature as the creature of God. That is to say, nature here will share its creatureliness with man. Man is part of nature specifically in the sense that both are the creatures of God, and that man somehow has a special role within nature as the conscious being, the only conscious being, that can deny God and that therefore can affirm God. Since this is the case then, any religious worldview contains within it not only a theory of man, a view of man, but also a view of nature, and particularly of man's relationship with nature and of the relationship of nature with God, the dependence of nature upon God, in some sense at least, the dependence of nature upon God. So that if you, if you would wish to, and this is summarizing it intolerably here, but if you wish to put it this way, you could say that any form of religious understanding, any of the Western forms in particular, have usually involved, in some very broad sense, a cosmology, that is, a view of the universe. 
and a view of the universe not so much in its internal structures as an astrophysicist might look at quasars, but rather as, um, uh, as the, the arena of man on the one hand and as the creature of God on the other. And this involves an affirmation. Now, this being the case then, <coughs> it will vary from one religion to another uh, what the precise understanding will be of nature, of the universe, and also it will vary considerably, I think, from one, not only from one religion to another, but from one period in a given religion to another period, that is, there will be a development on this notion, namely of what the religious understanding itself here rests on. Now, my point here would be this, that if you take, for example, Christianity, which is the uh, religion familiar, most familiar to most of us, it's, it's clear that at all times it has had a cosmology associated with it. But it's also clear that that cosmology has changed over the years. And let me just mention one important respect, uh, a respect in which I would very much have liked uh, to develop it if I'd had the opportunity, namely this. If you look at the uh, uh, early and medieval uh, views of nature and its relationship with man and with God, you find that the, the Christian understanding was, in a sense, limited to a very short stretch of space and of time for, for reasons of a somewhat literal understanding here of what the, uh, what the role of the word, of the revelation was here. Now, for this reason, and this was terribly important, it seems to me, for this reason, it was impossible for the medieval mind to grasp the cousinship of nature Scientists today will say that we are 57th cousin of a bread mold. Professor Dovshansky would give the scientific basis for that better than I would. But there is a way in which you can show uh, DNA-wise that we are 57th cousin of a bread mold, not a very heartening thought in some ways. Although, of course, bread molds are related to penicillin and they do lots of good. But at any rate, um, uh, the, if, you, if you look at it from this point of view, there is a sense in which you can say that the Christian of today, as he looks at his universe, will not see the universe as a series of discrete entities of giraffes and ostriches and mosquitoes and bread molds that simply are there. And the only answer to the question of why they're there is, well, it's God's will. Uh, God wanted giraffes and mosquitoes and elephants, inscrutable as this might seem. Now, that sort of answer, which was implicit in most previous religious cosmologies, is not, in fact, maintained today. Because today we can make an affirmation which is far more basically Christian, among other things. It will also fit in, although not, I think, so readily fit into Oriental religious belief, but it certainly is quite integral to Christianity, namely that the universe, as the scientist of today opens it out, is a universe in which everything, so to speak, is connected with everything else in a very highly textured history. The, the nebula has a history that will lead it to the stars. The stars have a, a history leading to planets. Planets will lead in, in a way that we can somehow trace to life and life to man. And all of this is a kind of textured relationship which of all, above all else makes the universe one universe, a single thing, one universe therefore. And therefore in that sense, worthy of God's creation. What we mean by creation therefore today, even the Christian who speaks of creation, is vastly different from what he meant by it a hundred or especially two thousand years ago. The notion of creation itself within Christianity has evolved uh, greatly, and I might perhaps point out the reverse thing, namely that the notion of creation of course itself did come from Judeo-Christianity to science. This is not unimportant, I think. But the point I'm really making then is this, I'm taking this only as an example of uh, uh, something much more widespread, namely that <laughs> Christianity, like other religions, does enshrine a worldview, and it enshrines a worldview because of the fact that it is centered around man and questions of human destiny, and that, human, that man is, after all, part of a universe into which science also gives us an ingress. This being the case, therefore, it can be claimed, and I think ought to be claimed, that for a Christian to understand himself as a Christian today, or reversely, to understand what the Christian... Um, vision is, he has got to understand science. I, uh, this is perhaps on the side, but this is important. So that what I'm saying here is this, that re religion does in fact have a role in man's effort to understand the universe. Uh, it's a role which rests variously on 
a relationship between man and God of faith, mediated by a revelation through Christ, for example, in the case of Christianity. But it is not a static one. It is in particular one which enters into a highly dynamic relationship with other elements in human understanding of poetry and of language and of myth, and even, although this is a modern realization, even of science. And I wouldn't even say even there, especially perhaps of science, but I, I can't develop that point any further. Um, now, uh, very quickly, does your concept of myth include a religious experience? Yes. The religious experience often issues in myth, and in fact many forms of myth, so far as we can tell, derive from a form of religious experience. That is to say, uh, although the notion of religious experience itself is not a very clear one, there are many uh, varieties of it, many ways in which it can be understood and defined, the religious experience itself, for example, in the case of primitive tribes, or in, for that matter in the case of the most sophisticated city dweller, can develop into a, a myth here understood as a symbolic way of relating man, dramatically speaking, to the world in which he lives, to, not only to other people, particularly to other people, but not only to other people, but to, the, to, to all upon which he depends, to the nature, to, to nature uh, over against him, to all the powers on which he depends for his well-being. If I understand all, all and can do all, what separates me from God? Well, as I tried to point out, what separates me from God actually is, and very precisely in the domain of my talk, is that I don't, not only do I not understand all, but there are two specific ways where I'm marked off from God here. I, I, there's no problem about the scientist ever thinking he's God. Only philosophers of science sometimes think that. Um, <laughs> Uh, the real scientist, I think, knows very well he's not God for two reasons. Firstly, because he is uncomfortably and perpetually aware that his science has a history. That's all he needs to think about. It's had a past which is full of failures, full of modifications, and obviously a future where the symbols will yet again be modified. He realizes, therefore, that there is, and this is the second point, a symbol and I'm using symbol in a very broad sense, a structure, a model, a metaphor, a theory between himself and what he's trying to grasp. He cannot reach out. His mind does not directly apprehend the DNA molecule. It, it apprehends it by way of a model, something indirect, which is never exact. The scientist knows that the model is not an exact copy. He has no intuitive grasp, therefore, of nature and no possibility of such a grasp. He may understand his wife that way, at least uh, such claims are made, although most wives will resist that with great energy. But he may understand some things, perhaps intuitively, but one thing we can be sure of, and that is that man does not understand nature that way, although at one time it was hoped that he could. Part of the Greek, as I try to suggest, part of the Greek uh, claim, or uh, underlying the Greek claim, was something like that. And in fact, you find it in Galileo, a very famous passage where, God, where uh, Galileo says that the language of nature the book of nature is written in the language of mathematics, and the language of mathematics for man is exactly the same as it is for God. There is implicit in this, then, a, a very um, a, a highly suggestive uh, a, a idea, namely that if we can grasp nature fully in the language of mathematics, it will be as well off as God is. Well, 300 years of science have shown that that was overly optimistic. Uh, the, the other thing, of course, is that God, that, uh, the, uh, that God is not part of time, uh, in the Christian view at least, he is not part of time. Time is precisely his major creature. Time is what he creates. God is not present. He is not past or future. God, in fact, creates. And creates is, a, is when we say a timeless act, it suggests it's going on all the time, which, of course, is wrong. Uh, there was no time at which God did not exist. Or, uh, uh, yes, there was no time at which the universe did not exist of course. Before the universe existed, there wasn't any time. Time is God's creature, you see, and therefore, since the major problems of the scientist are a stretch in time to know what went on in the past, to know what will go on in the future, this outreach in time and outreach in space, which is the barrier of the scientist, which he tries to mediate by way of symbol, is not a barrier for God in the Christian view of God, because God is immediately present by way of creative power to all moments in time. He is not, in fact, part of time. Uh, man, uh, man is preoccupied with uh, technology. He has forgotten his responsibility towards fellow man and nature in terms of the morality of his exploitation of his discoveries. As a result of his preoccupation with technology, he has alienated himself from man and nature. 
Now, <clears throat> this whole question of technology I have left out of account. It is quite true, I think, that technology, which today in our own century is for the first time an extension of scientific understanding, until about a hundred years ago, technology marched relatively under, uh, independently of scientific understanding. 1850 is the date that is often given somewhat arbitrarily for a new period, namely where technology is governed by or guided by scientific understanding. The technology before that period was governed much more by fitting and trying, by a kind of gift or uh, um, a kind of uh, set of expedients that were handed on from craftsman to craftsman, even as much as uh, even as late as a hundred years ago, I think. But in our in, since about the middle of the last century, and especially in our own century, the pace of technology has in, has very much picked up simply because theoretical understanding is being brought to bear. You can see this especially in the gigantic engineering projects of today, like the Moon Project. But it, 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 in this uh, uh, vastly accelerating technology of today, which is accelerating precisely because, for the first time, theoretical understanding is capable of being brought to bear upon it. In this, of course, <coughs> uh, we have to ask not the question of, of what the technological possibilities are, but of what the moral dimensions of it are, because this always involves uh, questions of modifying the world, of changing the world, of making some things available in a different order to others, of choices, of setting certain goals above others, of setting the moon above cancer or below cancer, and so on, of putting the two equally. There are certain kinds of value decisions which are inherent in technology today at the highest level where uh, questions of morality and exploitation come in. This is not a question of understanding in the sense in which I have uh, adopted it today. This is rather a question where the human understanding uh, is, has got to the point that it is beginning to pose enormous and it sometimes seems almost insoluble moral problems. This was not true in another age, but it is true, to, at least not at all in the same way. The scientific understanding today poses an enormous problem to the moralist because the scientific understanding can change the world and it can change nature. It is no use appealing here to a natural law when the very point itself is that nature can be changed. We have a far more complex situation. Do, do you feel that there will be a fourth great moment in human understanding? This has often been suggested. It has often been suggested that ahead for us lies a different state, and the different state has nearly always been suggested to be something like a mystic state in various forms, an intuitive state which would not be mediated by symbol. Personally, I, I am a little skeptical.